Heteroscedasticity consistent standards or robust standards are quite common in empirical work. Their extension is cluster robust standards which takes care of the non-independence of the observations. These te techniques are fairly simple to use because they have been programmed in the many commonly available statistical software and if your software supports these standards their use is simply a matter of switching their, them on and you don't need to really understand the math behind how the standards are calculated. But in this particular case going through the math behind these two types of standards allows us to learn something about what these standards do, what they are capable of, what are their limitations and also in the case of cluster robust standards uh, looking at the equation allows us to, to uh, learn something new about when clustering of observations would be a problem and when not. So in this video I will walk you through how the heteroscedastic robust standards are derived and how the cluster robust standards are derived and uh, where do we actually make the heteroscedasticity and the independence of observations assumptions in regression analysis and what those assumptions actually mean for the calculations. Let's start with heteroscedasticity. So the idea of heteroscedasticity was that if we have a predictor here on the x-axis and then we have a regression line, the population regression line and then we have the error term which is the variation of the observations around the regression line then the variance of the, of the error term is not constant. So the idea is that uh, in, in some parts of the regression line there is less variation than in other parts like here. So uh, the variance here basically is, is uh, varies as x varies. The homoscedasticity assumption was that this variance around the regression line is constant so that the observations don't spread out and don't become closer to the regression line here. Of course you can have many other shapes of heteroscedasticity beyond this simple uh, funnel shape. And uh, this was the, uh, the fifth assumption in regression analysis and it was required for consistent estimation of the standard errors. If there is a uh, Lack of, lack of homoscedasticity or if there's heteroscedasticity in your data, then your conventional standard error equation will produce incorrect results. So let's take a look at why heteroscedasticity causes problems for the conventional standard errors. So the conventional standard errors are calculated using this equation. This is the variance of the estimates. So we have the sigma here and uh, this is simply the variance of the error term. We replace the variance of the error term with the variance of the residuals which is the estimate of the variance of the error term and then we divide it by sum of squares total x and uh, which is just uh, the sum of squares of x minus uh, the mean of x. So how much x varies around its mean multiplied by sample size. And that gives us an estimate of the standard error of regression coefficient in the simpler regression case. So let's take a look at uh, first where this uh, simple equation comes from and uh, why we need the homoscedasticity assumption. If the homoscedasticity assumption fails then we have this alternative formula which can be found in many econometrics textbooks where you uh, take uh, the residuals and then you multiply squared residuals with uh, the square differences of the observations from their means and then you take a sum and you divide by sum of squares total x to the second power and that gives you the heteroscedasticity robust standard errors. So let's take a look at why this works and this doesn't under heteroscedasticity. So uh, we need to start by looking at uh, what is the variance of the regression coefficients and uh, we derive this variance formula on this slide and I will take a couple of shortcuts. You can get the full derivation in your favorite econometrics book and um, I'll just uh, take a few shortcuts to, to, uh, to make it fit in one slide. And uh, we will derive uh, a bit one particular useful form of this equation. So let's start with the covariance of, of x and y divided by variance of x which is the, uh, the simple regression coefficient estimated by OSL. We can write out the covariance and the variance equations. So uh, the covariance is simply uh, how much an observation uh, minus its mean multiplied by an observation another variable minus its mean. What is the, uh, the average 
square of, of these two differences. So we work with uh, differences from the mean, we, we multiply two differences from the mean and then we take uh, the average, we, multi we divide with by n minus 1 which is an, un uh, con which is an unbiased estimate of our covariance. Then we have uh, the variance which is simply uh, the covariance of the observation with itself. And uh, this can be simplified by eliminating the n minus 1 because it appears in both um, the, the numerator, numerator and the denominator and uh, we can further simplify by writing this uh, as squares. So we have uh, this sum of squares from uh, mean. So this is basically a uh, sum of squares residuals from a regression equation that only has an intercept. So this is the sum of squares total x which is the sum of squares of the null model if we just regress uh, x on and, and use only an intercept. And uh, we write it as sum of squares total x. So we, we take differences from the mean, we, we square those differences and we take a sum that is a sum of squares total and we do that for the variable x. So let's move on and uh, we can take uh, this equation here, this upper part, and we can separate it. So we can write it out as um, x minus x bar times y1 and multiplied by x minus x bar times y bar. y bar is simply the mean of y. Turns out that this here is actually zero so we can take it out and uh, we have x minus its mean multiplied by y divided by sum of squares total x. y of course is our dependent variable and it can be written as a function of the population regression model. So y is beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus the error term as the, the model defines. And uh, we can further simplify this equation by um, splitting it into two. The beta 0 is, uh, is constant and it, it will be eliminated because this is, uh, has a mean of 0. And uh, then we have this two parts here, this sum. We have the beta 1 times x minus x bar times xi and turns out that that is the same as sum of squares total x. And uh, this gives us a convenient formula. So uh, the estimate of beta is beta 1 plus this thing here. So uh, to understand how much the, the beta hat or the estimate of beta varies, we need to understand how much this varies here because uh, this regression coefficient beta in the population, that's a known, that's a fixed value, it doesn't vary. So the so only thing that varies here is, is this part and how much it varies is what our standard error quantifies. So we are, uh, now we start looking at the, deriving the standard error. So how do we actually estimate how much this thing here varies? And uh, we write out the variation here so variation of beta is variation of this sum and uh, we can now uh, we can drop the beta one out because it doesn't vary it's it's a population quantity it's fixed and uh, we, in regression analysis without going uh, into details we treat the x variables as fixed too so uh, sum of squares totals x is fixed and uh, we we can or that's constant in our equation and when we have variance of constant times something then uh, that is, or let's say that we have constant times x and we want to take the variance of that, then that is constant squared times the variance of x. So if you uh, remember path analysis tracing rules, when you, uh, go, when, you when you calculate the variance of something, you always go to the source and come back, which means that you take squares, we take squares as here as well. So we have sum of squares total x to the second power uh, dividing this variance of, of x minus x bar or, or uh, difference of x from its mean multiplied by the error term. And um, we can further simplify this by uh, taking uh, this variance and uh, moving the sum outside the variance function. So uh, the variance of the sum of independent variables is the sum of their variances. So that's the, uh, that's the idea here. And um, this equation now we can still make it a bit simpler because um, this variance of x minus x bar 
this x minus x bar is fixed value. So it's fixed because x is fixed. We can move it outside the variance function. So it's x minus its mean to the second power multiplied by variance of the error term for one particular observation. And now at this point we have to make the homoscedasticity assumption. So uh, this far we haven't made any assumptions that this variance of ui would be constant. If we assume that the variance of ui is constant, it doesn't vary uh, with as a function of x or anything, then we can actually uh, take this variance of u and uh, move it, replace it and uh, move it outside the sum function. So we have the variance of u, which is the variance of error term, multiplied by this thing here, which is simply the sum of squares total. And uh, we have sum of squares total to the second power here. And that gives us the variance of error term divided by sum of squares total. And this variance of the error term is estimated with the variance of the residuals. So that's the normal conventional standard errors. You can find this derivation in your favorite econometrics book if the book is any good and they uh, may explain a few more steps in, in why, uh, like why some terms were zero. I just stated that they were zero without explanation. So uh, what if we have um, heteroscedasticity? What if we can't make the homoscedasticity assumption that we require from moving from this line to, to this line? So what do we do about it? And uh, let's take a look. So uh, the idea here is that uh, we can't move this variance of, of, of ui outside the sum because it's not constant. We can move it if it's constant because uh, sum of, of different elements multiplied by the same constant is the same as that constant multiplying the sum of those elements. If ui is different for each observation, we of course can move it out. So, uh, so how do we deal with this problem? We deal with this problem by actually replacing the ui here, the variance of ui, with the squared residual for that observation. So the idea was that uh, the uh, variance is the, uh, the mean of square differences from the mean. We know that the residuals have a mean of zero and the error term has a mean of zero as well. So we can estimate the variance for each observation separately with by using the, uh, the squared residual. So, uh, so we take this kind of equation and that's our heteroscedasticity consistence and errors. So uh, and uh, this heteroscedasticity consistent standard error can also be used for regression with multiple predictor variables. In that case we use matrix equations and the equation looks like that. These are called uh, Iker, Huber or White standard errors or a combination of these names based on statisticians who have discussed and introduced these concepts to the literature. This is also called a uh, sandwich estimator because uh, we have this, this X matrix here and we have the other X matrix here and then it, this, uh, this beef, this uh, residual squared multiplied by the observation pair squared observation squared is uh, sandwiched between these two uh, other matrices. So that's, it's called sandwich estimator for that reason. So you can see that there is some, uh, this is sum of squares total and this is sum of squares total because in matrices when you multiply two things together the order matters. For that reason we have one on the left side, one on the other side instead of multiplying it twice. The minus one is inverse which is basically the same as our, our equivalent to taking uh, uh, dividing something uh, one by something so you create an inverse and uh, otherwise it looks the same so we take residual squared we have observation squared and then we multiply by sum of squares total. So uh, the matrices uh, are something that if you that are useful if you want to study this technique yourself but as a normal researcher uh, you don't really have to know how to read all that stuff. So uh, the question now is that if, if these don't assume that there's homoscedasticity, they are more general because they all also work under any heterogeneity or uh, heteroscedasticity, then uh, 
why, when should we use this and why not always use heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. The, the thing is that heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors have been proven to work in large samples and there is some evidence that their performance may not be that good when the sample size is very small. So in practice if you have large samples, uh, several hundreds or thousands, then using heteroscedasticity robust SCs as a standard practice is, is probably not a bad idea. If you work on, on small samples like you have experimental data, you have just maybe 40 people in each experimental group, then uh, you may be uh, better off using the normal standard errors even if there is slight heteroscedasticity in your data. The reason why these uh, don't work as well in, in large small samples is that this uh, residual squared here is uh, not a good estimator for the, the particular variance of the error term in small samples. So this gets better and better as the sample size increases. So uh, heteroscedasticity robust standard errors allow you to deal with heteroscedasticity and the uh, way you use them is that you simply turn them on. Understanding cluster robust standard errors is something that allows you to understand the effects of clustering. So let's take a look at the cluster standard errors. So the idea of, of heteroscedasticity robust standard errors was in matrix form that you take the, uh, the residual of one observation and you square it. In cluster robust standard errors you take two different residuals belonging to the same cluster and you multiply them together and you repeat that for every uh, observation in the same cluster. And why would you want to do that and, and what's the point and what does this equation and, or analyzing this equation tell us about the effects of clustering on normal regression model. Let's take a look at this particular part here and why do we have two different residuals. So here we have one residual, here we have two different residuals. Of course we could have the same residual but we basically uh, multiply every, every pair of residuals together. So let's take a look at this derivation of, of uh, heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. So that's the heteroscedasticity or that's the normal standard errors. We make the heteroscedasticity assumption here and we actually have to make the independence of observations assumption a bit before. So it's here. So why do we need the independence of observations here? The reason is that when we take a sum of these uh, differences from the mean multiplied by the, the error term, the, the sum of these, the variance of, of this sum is the sum of these variances only if the observations are independent. So if you take two variables, their, so the variance of the sum is the sum of variances only if those two variables are uncorrelated or independent. So, uh, so what do we do, do when that fails? So, so we can't move from here and then uh, split, uh, move this uh, sum outside the variance. We, we can't do that because of non-independence of observations. What we actually do here in the cluster robust standard errors is that we uh, calculate this variance. It is actually a sum of variances plus all the sum of, sum of all covariances in the cluster. So uh, if we have 10 observations then the variance is in 45 covariances 10 variances and the variance here variance of the sum is the sum of those 10 covariances plus two times the 45 covariances or we can just use each covariance twice in the sum. So, so we take a look at this this covariance between the observations in the cluster. That covariance can be from multiple different sources. It can be from unobserved heterogeneity. So, so some clusters are on average higher than others and there is no particular pattern. In panel data this can be autocorrelation. So it can be that observations close to each other in time are more similar to observations than op to one another than observations that are far apart on, on time. And what we do is that we take this u i and u j 
the error returns for two different observations. We replace those with the residuals, we reorganize a bit. So covariance between these um, two products is because the, the means are zeros is simply there are whatever is the product of all these things multiplied together. So that's our heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors and uh, that's the equation in matrix form. Looking at this equation and looking at the variance equation for the regression coefficient in clustered with cluster data allows us to learn something about the effects of clustering. So let's take a look at these two equations. So this is the, uh, the variance formula. If we know the variance or the covariance between two observations in the same cl cluster in the population, we know there are then, then we, we can, and we know the sum of squares total, then we can calculate how much the regression coefficients are estimated from repeated samples from that population would vary from one sample to another. And this is the equation that we use to estimate that variance. So this is an estimate of variance or, or standard error and this is uh, the actual variance if we know these values. So let's take a look at that part first. So what does that tell us? We can uh, use a little bit of covariance algebra and uh, Let's write it down and uh, I'm going to use d for, for x minus mean of x. So we just work with difference scores and uh, the difference score for i and, and the ui covariance with a different score of, of j and uj is simply uh, whatever is the expected value of the product of all these things minus the means of, of these these two terms here. Well the, 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 um, the means are simply zero, so this uh, is eliminated here and the covariance is simply whatever is the expected value or the mean if we multiply all these four things, the error, two error terms and two uh, deviations of x from the mean together and then we take a sum and then we, mul then we divide by, by the number. So, so we take it, multiply, calculate this quantity for each observation, take a mean. And because the error terms are assumed to be uncorrelated with the predictor. So that's the no endogeneity assumption. This equation can be, can be uh, separated. So it's uh, what is the expected value of, of these two errors, these two deviations from the mean of x and these two error terms, which is the same as, as covariance between two predictors multiplied by covariance between two error terms. And this equation actually uh, gives us some insights that are demonstrated in another video with a simulation using simulated data set. The, the, the thing here is that if two observations are independent, so if ICC1 of x is zero, then this term here will be zero. And so uh, whatever the correlation between the two error terms is, doesn't matter. So if your x variables are independent of one another, there's no clustering effect, no other correlation, no, no anything in the x variables, then it turns out that non-independence of the error term is actually not the problem for your analysis, which is uh, kind of an interesting result. It's not probably very practical, but it explains why in another video we, we can't get a clustering effects if we just manipulate the ICC of one variable but not the other. If we look at the actual equation that we use for, for calculating the standard error, we can look at, at this part here. So uh, because we multiply two residuals together and we do that separately for each pair within a, cl a cluster, and we do that for each cluster independently. This implies that the cluster robust standard errors are valid regardless of how the observations, the error terms are correlated. So there, there can be a strong autocorrelation for some cluster, no autocorrelation for other cluster, and these standard errors don't care because we don't make any assumptions about any covariances. We uh, estimate every covariance within cluster by taking multiplying two residuals together. So this is robust for arbitrary within cluster error correlations. 
most traditional techniques for panel data particularly focus on unobserved heterogeneity and unobserved heterogeneity manifests in error terms that are correlated within cluster but that correlation is constant. So there is there is no in normal traditional panel data model there is a uh, no effect that two observations that are closer to one another are more similar than two observations that are farther from each other. So uh, that would be an out require a model for autocorrelation. So this cluster robust standard errors in contrast to for example GLS fixed effects and GLS random effects also allows you to have other correlation structures beyond the basic structure where each observation is correlated at the same level with any other observation. So it, it's more robust and that's the that's one reason why you when you work with panel data you should always consider using cluster robust standard errors even if you applied already an estimation technique that took unobserved heterogeneity into account. The second point that we learn from here is that we, when we have two residuals that we multiply together here then uh, that, that is a poor estimator of the actual covariance unless our sample size gets large. So if the number of clusters is small, then uh, the, the standard errors are typically small too, uh, typically biased. And uh, this is a problem that you can't solve by increasing the number of observations within clusters. So there are, the idea is that if you have, uh, let's say you have 30 companies that you follow, and you follow them for 10 years, so you have 300 observations, you, are, you could be concerned that your cluster robust standard errors are slightly biased because of the small, number of, small, small number of clusters, then increasing the number of observations within cluster from uh, 10 to 20 to increase the total sample size to 600 wouldn't do anything for, for the potential bias. So this depends on uh, whether this is uh, accurate or not, depends on the number of clusters and uh, what is sufficient. It's difficult to say, for example, Angris here, you says that, uh, well, maybe 40 would be uh, like a, a minimum limit. So if you have observation number of clusters below 40, then you could be in trouble. If you have more than 40, then you could be fine. But this, of course, depends on many different things. So we can't just uh, set a, a one cutoff that would be useful in all scenarios. But that gives you a ballpark estimate of what kind of numbers of clusters are needed for this technique to be uh, really useful. So uh, this video went through some of the math to, uh, to show some insights about how clustering works, how it affects the variance of regression coefficients. And the key takeaways here is that these techniques are useful, but they require large sample sizes. If you want to apply these techniques, you don't actually have to understand much of the math here because these are typically applied by just switching them on in software that supports them.